gonna, um, we've been in a series, but I'm going to kind of take a little segue from it just for two weeks. And I want to teach on something this morning, and the title of it is Through Thick and Thin. Everybody say that. Say Through Thick and Thin. You know, when you think about the, the title or you think about that statement through thick and thin is it applies to friendships. How many of you know what I mean? How many of you have a friend in your life that could have and maybe should have given up on you, but they didn't give up on you? How many of you know what I'm saying? Brad's got his hand up real high. It's, you know what I'm saying? Okay, look, we're going to give you one more chance. Okay, you made, you know what I'm saying? A friend that could have or possibly should have given up on you and they just stuck it out. They just, they just stuck it out. When you use the term and you think about friendship and real friendship, what does that mean to you when you say it? And I'm just going to, as I ask that question, I'm going to open it up and just have you kind of just shout something back at me. When you think of an attribute of a good friend, go ahead, shout back at me and I'll say it. Go ahead. Anybody? Someone who listens. That's a good one. Somebody else. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. I like that. Loyal. Anybody else? Caring? Forgiving. Oh, that's a good one right there. How many of y'all know we all make mistakes? Accepting. That's a good one. Accepting. Anything else? Anybody else? Huh? Honest. Oh, that's a really good one. How many of you know we need honest friends that'll tell us the truth and not let us run into a wall and say, I love you, man. How many of you know what I'm saying? Anything else? True friends. What are attributes of a, somebody that's a true friend? I mean, we could go on and on and on. But with that mindset and with that thought, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at an encounter with Jesus in the gospel of Mark. And then we're going to unpack it and bring it contemporary to where we're at in our day. Because this story is all about a friend or being a friend. Look at what it says. And this is in Mark chapter 2. Verse, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. It says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Now, what I want you to notice is the term or the word used, returned, and then it says that Jesus was back home. For somebody to return somewhere, it means that they have been there before, and then when they use the, when the, when the word is used, he was back home. The Amplified says it like this, that he was in Peter's house. This is where Peter lived, and he was in Peter's house. And, and if you look, what I love about this, this story, and this is just going to be, I'll give you number one, is this story is about people who were familiar with Jesus. They were familiar with him. They knew about him. You know, when it says in Matthew chapter four, verse 13, that Capernaum was where Jesus lived after he moved away from Nazareth. After persecution broke out against John and they beheaded John, the Bible says that Jesus moved away from Nazareth and he moved to this, this town called Called Capernaum. And so when it makes the statement or it says that Jesus, what he had returned and was back home, is that the people in this town were very familiar with him. And if you study what you find out, is that re you remember the story when Peter's mother in law had a fever, had a fever. And the Bible says that Jesus prayed for her and the fever instantly left. That was in this exact house that this story is talking about right here. Is, is if you look as Capernaum was a very small fishing village on the Sea of Galilee. And what we know is this, is that five of his disciples came from this town. There was Peter, there was Andrew, there was James, there was John, and then there was Levi, who Jesus called Matthew, was a tax collector. They all came from this same town. See, this is the town that Jesus was there. And you remember the story of the centurion that came to Jesus and said that, that my servant is homesick, but you just speak the word and he will be healed. Do you remember that? He said, I'm a man under authority. I understand authority. You just speak the word. Jesus was in Capernaum when this happened. The guy, that centurion came to Capernaum. Do you remember the story of the nobleman when his son was sick and he came to Capernaum and he said to Jesus, he said, come in 
and heal my son. And Jesus said, go your way, he's healed. And when the nobleman got back, we find out he asked the servant in the house, he said, when did he start getting better? And he realized that it was the moment that Jesus said, go your way, he is healed. Do you remember the, do you remember the story when Jesus fed the 5,000? And the Bible says that he fed the 5,000 and everybody was so jacked up about it that they said that they wanted him, they were getting ready to force him to become their king. And so they were gonna force him into being the king. And the Bible says that Jesus perceived what they were getting ready to do and he went up to the mountains to pray and he left the 12 and the crowd down there and he went up to a solitary place and he was praying. And the Bible says that late in the evening, the disciples began to look around and say, where's Jesus? Where's he at? And it says that they got into a boat and went over to the other side. Well, where they were going was Capernaum. That's where they went. And so, and stand to reason because that's where Jesus lived. That's where they were all from. So that you remember the story, they got into the boat and it says like three o'clock in the morning, they were rowing, but the wind was against them. And Jesus went walking on the sea. You remember the story, whole story of Peter said, if that's you, they were going to to Capernaum. Jesus got into the boat, the wind ceased, and they arrived on the shore at Capernaum. Capernaum was a place that was very familiar with Jesus. See, there was a high level of familiarity with Jesus in this town. And at this particular time, is the town of Capernaum was 1,500 people. That was a total population of the people that lived in that town. And I'm sure that they had heard about him a lot. They had seen him many times. And it's what verse one tells us is news has spread that Jesus is back in town and he's back home. Look at what it says in verse two. It says, so Jesus comes back, he's in the house, Peter's house. It says, soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room. Even outside the door while he was preaching God's word to them. This is number two, is they were excited to be taught by Jesus. How many of you'd be excited if Jesus came to your house? Now, let me just throw this out. How many of you would be just as excited if your house filled up with people you didn't know and they were all over your furniture, sitting on your bed, on your couch, on all of your stuff, and they were so packed that there wasn't even room in the doorway. They were just stuck. You couldn't get another person in there. I mean, picture this for a moment. It's so full that you cannot even get another person. People are standing on your bed. They're standing on your couch. They're, they're sitting on your dresser. They're all just packed and they're just absolutely squeezed, hanging out the windows. Look at what it says in verse three. It says, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. On a mat. Think about this for a moment. Is that these four guys obviously had planned when they heard about Jesus that they were gonna bring their friend to Jesus. And so what happens is, is it describes four of them all around and a paralyzed guy laying down on a mat. And possibly when you think about this story is these guys have walked miles to get this, their friend to Jesus. You know that in, I think this is interesting, just a little a statistic. Do you know how, uh, how far the average person um, walked in a day in the New Testament? 15 to 25 miles a day. That's how far they walked, 15 to 25 miles a day. <laughs> they, you know what they say is, it, by the time Jesus was 33, he went back to Jerusalem three times a year, and they said just that route in 33 years was 18,000 miles. Jesus walked. By the time he was 33, just the route to go to Jerusalem. It was over 100 miles from where he was. Back and forth, back and forth. That's how far Jesus walked. How many, let me just throw this out there. How far do you think the average American walks in a day? I got this stat. I'm just going to throw it out there. How many of you know? Okay, I'll just, you guys can just talk back at me. Do you think that you think we walk 10? No. Seven. No. Five. I'm gonna keep going, but I'm gonna add this in here, is when we're talking about walking, we're talking equally about getting out of bed and going to the coffee maker. 
Okay, we're talking about getting up in the night and going to the bathroom. Okay, we're talking about every step. They say an average mile is 2,000 steps. That's how far an average mile is. Okay, so the average American walks somewhere around two miles a day. That's how far we walk. Is that, and that includes everything when we talk about our whole. So these guys are used to walking 15 to 25 miles a day. And what I want you to notice is four of them are carrying a friend that is paralyzed on a mat. And if you could imagine them coming around the corner, maybe after having carried him a few miles on this mat, telling him where we're going. This guy, Jesus, we've heard he'll heal. You're paralyzed. You're our friend, we're taking you. And so they're en route to this and they come around the corner. And I want you to just picture this in your mind's eye as they come around the corner and all they see is this house that is so stuffed with people that you can't even get in the door. You can't even see Jesus. And so they're standing there looking at the mass like, oh my gosh. I didn't, we planned for this, but we didn't plan for this. And they're standing there. And what I want, and this is number three, and this applies to those that were in the house, is they were oblivious to the needs of outside the house. See, they were in the house, they were receiving the word, but they were oblivious to what was going outside the house. And outside the house, there's a guy on a stretcher. And what I want you to notice is it says that four had thought of somebody that they knew when they knew that Jesus was going to be in the house. They thought of somebody they knew. They weren't just going to see Jesus for themselves. They were going to see Jesus for their friend. They thought of their friend that needed a touch of God. Let me ask you a question. How many of us have a friend that needs God in our life? See, this is where these guys were, is they had planned it out. They went out of their way. They were moved. What motivated, I'm sure, was compassion. It was care, and they loved him. Look at what it says in verse 4. It says they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. I want you to think about this. I mean, if I was, it, I'm just gonna throw this out here. Dan, if I were to show up and be teaching at your house and a whole bunch of us came and there was no more room and somebody showed up with some guy on a mat and we're sitting in there being taught and they start ripping a hole in your roof. How many of y'all know, meeting over, everybody go home. How many of you know what I'm saying? Tearing a hole in my roof because all I did was say, yes, Lord, you can turn the, you can have your life group in my house tonight. And so Jesus is teaching and they begin to, they, they begin to rip a hole. And if you stop and you think about this for a moment, is first they had to locate where Jesus was in the house. So I could just imagine them saying, one of us, get up on the roof. And they get up on the roof, and he's like. <laughs> and he gets over there, and he's like, okay, back up. Just back up. Stop. Right there, right there. Stay right there. Then they get this guy on the stretcher and lift him up on the roof. The guy's on a stretcher. And they lift him up on the roof. And what I want you to notice is this, is they proceed to tear a hole in the roof. Now we stop and we think, oh, they just tore. Let me tell you, to get a person on a stretcher through the roof, it's got to be a hole that is at least seven feet long and three feet wide. This is somebody said, well, you know, they just had those really easy thatch grass roofs. Their roof was holding five grown men. Okay, so five grown men is a pretty sturdy roof. That's not just like a little thatch roof. It's a pretty sturdy roof. So you could imagine Jesus is teaching and I'll just be Jesus. Okay, and all of a sudden in the middle of his teaching, garbage starts falling from up above on the people in the crowd. And he's sitting there and it's like, how many of you know that would be a disruption to my teaching this morning? 
if I was here and all of a sudden pieces of the roof start falling into this section right here. And, and this is what is going on. Jesus is teaching and what they do is he's teaching and the ceiling begins to open up. Pieces are following, falling through. I could imagine that, that they're interrupting Jesus' teaching. And as we read the story, what we're going to find out is there was a whole bunch of religious people in this crowd. And if you've ever, if you study and you see about these religious people, I could imagine I'm sitting there, this would have never happened if he had come in our synagogue. This would have never happened. You know what I'm saying? That this is just ridiculous. Look at these people. They're ripping a hole. They're a bunch of hooligans ripping holes in the roof. What I want you to notice is this, is the next thing is it says that they lowered him in front of Jesus. Lowered means they had ropes on the handles and he's maybe 10, 12 feet up and they rip a hole and four of them begin to lower him and he comes down right in front of Jesus. Now I want to ask you a question. What happened if two of, if one of them wasn't coordinated with the other three and accidentally let the rope out too much or the other ones went down too fast? What's going to happen to the guy on the stretcher? He's going to get dumped on the crowd. How many of you have seen those concerts where the guy's floating around on the crowd? is he's gonna get dumped. Could you imagine being the paralyzed guy that is laying there and saying, you're gonna do what? <laughs> you do realize I cannot brace myself. It's okay, I promise. We're gonna do our best. We've already got the hole out. We can't stop now. Just relax, just relax. I'm gonna close my eyes then. I'm just gonna close my eyes. And they lower this guy in front of Jesus. Man, this is, I, you, you look at this story. And the, did I give you number four? Is four people made up their mind to bring their friend to Jesus. And it was at any cost. They were gonna, not going to be stopped. You stop and you look as they couldn't get in. They wouldn't take no for an answer. They were willing to go beyond. I mean, they went way beyond. They dug a hole through a roof and they lowered him. Look at what it says in verse five. Seeing their faith. I want to just throw this out there. It didn't say seeing his faith. It says seeing their faith. See, Jesus saw the faith of the friends. Jesus looked and he saw the faith of the friends that were there. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. What I want you to notice is this, is what got their friend to Jesus was their faith. It was their faith of saying, I'm not gonna stop at discouragement. I'm not gonna accept a deterrent. I'm not gonna allow the crowd to discourage me. Okay, so we're gonna risk a hole through a roof and we're going to have to each shell out 50 bucks afterwards to buy the roofing material but we're going to get our friend in front of Jesus that's what they did they they lowered him through the roof and what I love about this is this is this guy was touched by Jesus because of somebody else's faith he was touched by God because of somebody else's faith this is number five is God can use my faith to change other people's lives. He can use my faith to change other people's lives. See, this guy had people in his life that cared enough about him that they were not gonna live in their comfortable spot, but they went outside their comfortable spot and they said, we're gonna get you to Jesus. We're gonna get you there. See, everybody knew where Jesus was but four friends thought of someone that they knew that needed Jesus. And what they did is they purposed to bring him to Jesus. And I like that verse five, seeing their faith. It wasn't this guy's faith. It was their faith. Their faith was seen by bringing somebody to Jesus. And then look at what Jesus said. Think about this for a moment. How many of you know it's pretty obvious what the guy needs? We can all agree on that. What did Jesus say? Your sins be forgiven. Excuse me, we're here for healing. That's the other line. How many of you know what I'm saying? 
How many, can you tell Jesus he's on a mat? We, we're here for healing. That's what we're here for. It's what I want you to notice is the statement, your sins be forgiven. Naturally, looking at this guy's natural life, you would say that was not his greatest need. He was paralyzed. He needed physical healing. But what I want you to notice is this, is we think someone's natural greatest need is this, but God sees beyond the surface of what's going on in our heart. And realize this, that what Jesus knew is this, is that if he will open the door to the forgiveness of God, everything else is just in the process of the strength and the ability and the grace and the love of God. What this guy needed was forgiveness. What this guy needed was the love of God. What this guy needed was the grace of God. And what I want you to notice is this, is everything else would come. And I think many times what we do is we look at our friends and we look at their outside needs and God is looking at their heart and he's saying no they don't need you know we look at our friend and say they just need counseling no they just need Jesus oh they just need a car no they just need Jesus oh they just need healing no they need Jesus oh they need a husband or a wife no they need Jesus no they need a, a financial miracle no they need Jesus and what it is is what we do they need freedom no they need Jesus he is the king of kings and lord of lords and he brings freedom them into our life. Well, they just need peace. Well, he is the prince of peace. He is the one that brings peace into our life. And if we don't watch it, what we do is we look at the outside of people and we say, what they need is this. But Jesus said, no, they need forgiveness and acceptance and my love in their life. And it is the game changer. It's the game changer. You know, I want to just throw this out there. You fill in the blank with your friends. Just stop and say, gosh, what do my friends need? Let me tell you what they need. They need the Lord. They need the Lord. You know, sometimes people say, well, they're, they're just, you know, they're too far gone. Let me just ask a question right now. How many of us in here were ever categorized as too far gone? Put your hand up. <laughs> we're the too far gone church. <laughs> you want to know Why? is because Jesus wants to be actively involved in people's lives who will admit they want him and need him. He is not involved in people's lives who don't need him or want him. We all need him, but it's when we come to a place in our life that we admit it. And you know, you stop and you think about it, is he is the only one that can change the heart and every other need flows with that. Look at what it says, and let's continue reading in verse six. Mark 2, 6. It says, but some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there, now look at this statement, thought to themselves. In other words, they never said it out loud. What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. I <laughs> want you to just tell you something. Jesus can hear our thoughts before we ever say them. How many of y'all know it's like, it's like he, we're going to see it. Jesus just answers their thoughts like they said it. How many of you know that's scary? <laughs> you know, you get around Jesus like, think right, think right, think right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Bless you, Lord, bless you, Lord. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these guys, these guys, Jesus, <laughs> and what it is, is, is now, what I love about it is you look at this and it begins to dissect the crowd that's there. There's this religious people that think they got it all together. That think that, you know, this is, you know, these uneducated, uncivilized people are all excited about him, but we've arrived. We've got it. They need him. We don't really need him. And Jesus begins to answer their thoughts. That's scary. You know what I'm saying? And I want you to think about this. And these four guys didn't care who was there. They didn't care. They had no fear of man. They had a greater love for their friend and a desire to get Jesus there. This is number six. It's not how much I know, it's how much I love. That's what it is. Sometimes in Christianity today, we can quote a bunch of scripture 
And I'm not, we should be able to, we need to meditate on God's word and get it in our heart. But Jesus said this, you can tell my disciples by their love. That's what he said. He said, you can tell the ones that are close to me by their love. And what you look at this is these guys, just what they did is they stepped out. Look at what it says in verse eight. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. Busted. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? It is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or, does, or stand up, pick up your mat and walk. So I will prove to you that the son of man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. How many of you all know that was a church service? <laughs> that was, that was, that was, I mean, they had, the, they, they had the full drama, rip the roof off, lower him down. How many of you know? And what I love, and this is my last point, number eight, is this is God is ready right now and he wants to use me. Do you know that God wants to use us to reach out to the world around us? Like these four, he wants to use us. You know, you stop and you think about this for a moment. Is who do I call a friend that doesn't know Jesus or isn't as close as they could be and they simply need a little help in their life? See, that's where these guys were. That's where they were. You know, if you look at the, the name Capernaum, in the, it comes from a Hebrew word, but this is what, it comes from actually two different Hebrew words that are, a, it's a compound of both. And what it means is this, it means a village protected by walls. And then the second word is to bring comfort and to console. And I like to put it like this, to bring protection and comfort from the outside world. That's what God has put us here to the world around us. That there is a comfort, that there is a protection, that there is a hope, and that there is a love that is different than the outside world. And he is the only one that can bring it into our life. He is the only one. And you know, you, you look at this and you think about it. I believe that God has called us as a church to bring protection and comfort from a crazy world that is going on. I think we can all readily sit there and right now, even in this whole election thing, how many of us recognize it's just crazy out there? It's just crazy. And let me just tell you, if you are looking for a person to save the situation, I want to tell you something. The only person that can fix the United States of America is Jesus. He is the only one. And our, you know, we can sit and we can watch and we can complain and we can say, look at this and look at that. How about just stopping and realizing that what God's plan is to change the world we live in is for us to say, Lord, I'm going to reach out to a friend and I'm going to bring him with me to church because what I know is the way you're going to move is one person at a time. And if you win one person at a time, what is amazing is this, is God, you can transform this whole nation in a very short period of time. And what it is, is it's where we all come together. You know, uh, this next week, we're doing something that we call Friend Day. Everybody say Friend Day. Friend. How many of you got a friend in your life? Put your hand up. Half of us have friends. That's really awesome. <laughs> I said, how many of you have friends? Now, let me throw this up, next word out there. And if you don't lift your hand, I just want to let you know I'm throwing rocks. Okay. <laughs> Number, let me just ask you this question. How many of you have a friend that doesn't know the Lord? Put your hand up. Just put your hand up. Do you know that this week, I believe that the Lord is saying to us, will you be one of the four? Will you be one of those four that grabbed hold of that stretcher and say, I'm gonna bring my friend. I'm just gonna bring my friend. Sometimes what our problem is, is we get all fear of man. Like, see, these guys didn't. You know, what if they tell me they don't wanna come? That's okay. So what, who cares? They told Jesus that. You know what I'm saying? But what it is, is we step outside of our comfort and we say, Lord, what I realize 
is what you've done in my heart is I just want to share it with somebody. I just want to reach out. It's not about a bunch of mechanics. It's just my story. What has God done in your heart? What has he done in your life? How far has he brought us? Has he brought you? You know, maybe right now, maybe in the last two or three weeks, God has just turned your world right side up where it was upside down. Maybe you look back at your life and you say, oh my gosh, two or three years ago. Sometimes what it is, is we discredit our own story because it's not something big. You know what? The world isn't looking for something big. They're looking for someone who's real. That's what they're looking for. And, and I think in our lives sometimes, you know, you look at this and it's where we stop and we ask the Lord, Lord, who is it in my life? What friend is it? You know, my church last year on friend day, which is next week, is we saw more than 50 people give their heart to the Lord for the first time. Isn't that awesome? More than 50 people gave their heart to the Lord for the very first time. Do you know that right now, this year, we, we, every time people get saved and I look and I kind of know, but people that, that we simply, our prayer is that Lord, you know, we believe the Lord that every year, Lord, that you will use our church to bring at least where we're at is we believe the Lord to bring 500 people into his house, into his kingdom that they did not know him and they gave their heart to Christ every year. That's what we believe. And you know, as we come into friend day, what church is about is it's about God's love. That's what it's about. It's about his love. And what we're asking every person here to do is this, where we just stop and we just ask the Lord, Lord, who is it in my life? We, got, we have an awesome church, but what it's all about is it's about knowing Jesus. And I believe that this next week that God is gonna touch a lot of our friends' lives. And the way that he's gonna do it is we're gonna step outside our comfort zone. We're gonna step outside, maybe just, you know, not being forthright, just that casual place. And what we're asking the Lord to do is to stir everyone's heart that calls Road to Life Church their church, to stir their heart and to say, Lord, who is it? It might be one person, it might be two, it might be five, it might be a family, whatever it is, but stir your heart to say, Lord, this next week, I'm gonna reach out to my little sphere of friends. And I'm not gonna be afraid. I'm not gonna be intimidated. I'm just gonna be real. And I'm just gonna invite them. Come to my church with me. We have a lot of fun. We have a lot of different, some different things planned next week. How many of you know we're a fun church? We like having fun. You know what I'm saying? How many of you know that, you know, when you stop and you think about it, I am convinced of this, that the world today is not rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting a cheap imitation that is in their mind. And we need to expose them to the real God. And it's where we come and we say, Lord, who is it in my life? That neighbor, that coworker, that relative, that friend. How many of you are sitting here saying, man, if this person would just give their heart to the Lord, my life would be a heck of a lot better. How many of you know what I'm saying? Where we just stop and we say, Lord, who is it in my life? And that's what we've been doing. I want you to stand up if you would. I want you to stand up. How many of you believe that the Lord can touch your friends? Let me see your hand. I want us all to lift up a hand to the Lord right now. Just lift up a hand to the Lord. Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we acknowledge your favor and your grace. That Lord, you have drawn us. And Lord, what we see in this story is that there were two different crowds. There was the crowd that was sitting being taught. And we know that that's part of it. But then equally, it was the balance of those four friends that loved somebody, that knew somebody, that needed you, and they went out of their way. They got him on the stretcher. They walked for miles. They faced discouragement. We can't get in. But what they did is their love for him was greater than quitting. And so they pushed themselves beyond. And Lord, I lift up every person here and I thank you for them. Lord, I thank you for every friendship, for every relationship. We started this morning by asking what a true friend is. And Lord, we heard a lot of descriptions of what it is. But Lord, what we see right here is what a true friend is, is one that brings their friends to you, brings them to the only one that can change the heart and the life. 
And Lord, this week, we reach out to you. And Lord, we thank you for softening hearts, for opening doors, for us to speak into our friends, our family, our coworkers' lives. And Lord, there is no pressure on us. We're just going to reach out and say, come with me to my church. We got something going on this next week called Friend Day. And I just want you to come and sit with me and be my friend and, and just worship with me and watch and just experience what God is doing. I want to encourage. God, we thank Thank you for your love for every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. You say amen. Think about this for a moment. A couple hundred people in here right now. What would happen if next week 200 people in this Berrien County gave their life to the Lord for the first time? Oh my gosh. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome? I mean, the people at Walmart would be nicer sometimes. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to single out. You know what I'm saying, though. You'd be like, what happened? You're different. You're different. <laughs> I was going to tell you a story. Should I tell it to you? <laughs> you know, my family, I'm from a family of 16 kids. <laughs> and my name's Mike. My parents were a blended family. We all lived, came together. I have an older brother by the name of Mike. My name's Mike. People would say, why do you have a brother named Mike? You know, we ran out of names, so we just started over. <laughs> I had an older brother, my older brother by the name of Mike, and he was just highly respected. Half of my brothers and sisters went to Catholic school for all the way through 12th grade. I was grateful I didn't have to, but they did. And, and my older brother, Mike, was my dad had six donut shops. And, and my older brother, Mike, wanted to follow in his footstep. And he wanted to have donut shop, too. And so he kind of, you know, got, a, got his degree in business and then just started working with my dad. He had a donut shop. But equally, on the other, he had another business, and it was a cannabis trade. How many of you know what I'm saying? He, he had a can, you said, what do you mean? He had a 400 square foot greenhouse in Southern California that he cultivated and was into agriculture. And most of his money came from his cannabis business. And, um, and so whenever he was around, he was just real giving, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> he, was, he, he was real giving, but a friend of his that he went to Catholic school with that just was going to some, went to some meeting over a weekend and he gave his life to the Lord. And he came home and he went to my brother, Mike, and he said, Mike, I just, you're my best friend and I just want you to come to this thing with me. And my brother was like, what are you there? He's like, just please, for me, just come with me. So he went with him to this, this weekend. It was like a, a, a retreat and Mike gave his life to the Lord. And he came home and he leveled his greenhouse. He cut everything down, destroyed it. He had a girlfriend that he had had for 10 years that they were planning on getting married. He immediately broke up with her. He immediately stopped and he said, God has called me to be a missionary. And he wanted to be a missionary. He's a lawyer now, but he wanted to be, you know, you're like, never mind. <laughs> And then what he did is he reached out to my younger brother, Marty, who Marty really, really liked him and identified, took Marty to a retreat the next weekend. Marty gave his life to the Lord. At our high school, there was this area over in the corner of the field, and it was school sanctioned. It was called Smoker's Field. And Smoker's Field is they had some picnic tables, and if you smoke cigarettes, you could go out there and smoke your cigarettes. But how many of y'all know they smoked more than cigarettes out in that field? Marty was out in Smoker's Field not smoking cigarettes on Friday. Over the weekend, gave his life to the Lord. And on Monday morning, was standing on the picnic table in Smoker's Field telling them all about Jesus. I'm only telling you about two of my family, no more. <laughs> but what it all started with was this. One person, one person said, will you come with me? And it's not us that changes people. It's us bringing them to Jesus that changes people. And you know, you're here and every one of us is I really, my prayer is that you take it to heart 
And that this next week, you just reach out. You know, we put this, there's a card here that says Friend Day. Maybe you've seen the billboard on M139. And it says, church is for anybody. I'm going to say that again. Church is for anybody. It's for anybody. And what it is is on the back, it just says Saturday, and it gives the times. And it just says where, and it's got the church's website on it. But as you leave today, what I want you to do is I want you, they're going to be passing these out at the door. Everybody should take at least one. Maybe you're here and you know three or four or five people. That's fine. Take as many as you want. But what we're believing the Lord to do is to touch the lives of our friends like this guy was touched in Mark 2. Where he just, and where we don't get all stuck on... They just need this, and they're just too far gone. But we just stop and say, Lord, I know that whatever their need is, you're greater. Amen? How many of you believe the Lord can do that? Thank you, God. I went a couple minutes long, and I'm going to close in just a second, but I want to just say this. We as a church, we realize the reason we're here is to bring people to God. That's why we're here. Part of that process is discipleship and teaching and growing up. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And maybe you're here today and you have never invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You have never come to a spot where you have said, you know what, I'm tired of doing it my way. I wanna tell you something. God loves you so much that he openly proved it by sending Jesus to the cross that while we were sinners and messed up and screwed up, Christ went to the cross to make a way for us, but we must respond to that way. It isn't just osmosis. Let me throw this out there. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Being a good person doesn't make you a Christian. Although Christians should go to church, Christians should be good people, but those works and acts don't make us a Christian. What makes us a Christian is when we come to a place in our life where we realize that I am a sinner, that I am separate from God, but that God loves me, he proved his love, and I wanna make Jesus the Lord of my life. And the Bible says at that moment, the forgiveness of God comes over our life. We are adopted as a child of God, and the Holy Spirit comes into our life. And maybe you're here, and you say, I've never done that before. God is using me right now because he loves you. He loves you, but only you can respond back to him with every head bowed and every eye closed. If that is you today, I want to pray with you right where you're at. But what I'm going to ask you to do is on the count of three to lift your hand to him. By lifting your hand, what you're saying is that I sense the Lord tugging at my heart and I am ready to give him my life and I am ready to be all in and give him my heart. You're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life or you're not where you should be. I wanna pray with you right where you're at. If that is you, on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand to him. One, two, three, that's you. Lift your hand to him, thank you. God is reaching out, thank you. Reaching into your life, thank you, thank you. He's reaching, thank you. Reaching into your life and into your heart. Lord, it is all about knowing you, sensing your presence, knowing you love us and you care about us. I want to lead us all in this prayer. Say this with me. Jesus, I believe that you gave your life to pay for my sins. And you rose from the dead, showing me that forgiveness is available. And right now, I make you my Lord. I'm asking you, forgive me. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a shout. Thank you, Lord. You're awesome, God. Look at me today. That's you. You gave your life to the Lord today for the first time, or you rededicated your life. As we close this,
this portion of the service, I want to encourage you to come on up. We want to help you to grow beyond that decision by giving you a Bible and encouraging you in what God has for your life. But equally, if you're here and you say, I know the Lord, but I just need prayer, I want to encourage you. Come on up. We'd love to pray with you. Thanks for coming. And don't forget, the ushers, the greeters are going to be giving everybody a card as you go out. And next week, bring your friend with you and watch what the Lord does. God bless you. Don't forget to go to life groups this week.